Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. This episode of the Sports Spectrum podcast with MLB umpire Chris Guccione is brought to you by Compassion International. $38 a month releases a child from poverty, and you can be the person that makes that difference by going to Compassion dot com and use that url compassion.com slash sports spectrum and you make a difference in a child's life here's what you do you go onto the website and you see all the children on there that are waiting to be sponsored around the world through compassion you go you pray about it you talk to your family your wife your girlfriend whatever and then choose the child that you want to sponsor and instantly you are connected to this child and making a difference releasing them from poverty. My wife, my daughter, myself, we sponsor a child through Compassion, a 13-year-old boy from Haiti. And it's the best $38 we spend every single month through the great work being done at Compassion International, releasing children from poverty, make a difference in a child's life. You can do it. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum and sponsor a child today. Today's guest on the podcast, MLB umpire Chris Guccione joins us here on the podcast to share his story, to share his testimony. Gooch, as they call him, has been a Major League Baseball umpire since 2000. He made his debut April 25th, 2000, and was part-time for nine years until 2009 when he finally became a full-time Major League Baseball umpire. He's umpired many, many postseason games, including... Six division series, two National League and American League championship series. And he was part of that memorable World Series in 2016 between the Indians and the Cubs. Seven games right down to the wire. The seventh game being memorable in Cleveland when Chicago finally won their first World Series in 100 years. Chris Guccione, who joins us here, was one of the umpires in that World Series. 22 years as a professional baseball umpire who also happens to be a believer in Christ. Now, Chris's story is a little different because he didn't grow up Christian. Uh, he He had a belief in God and he kind of knew who Christ was, but he didn't have a relationship until about six, seven years ago. Uh, so I really enjoyed talking to Chris just about, you know, a little bit of baseball on the, on the field and what it's like to be an umpire, but even more kind of where his faith and where his testimony took place and how he stays grounded uh, in the Lord during a long baseball season. And him and some other umpires have got this really cool thing going on called Calling for Christ, which is an umpire ministry. And they stay grounded in the Lord throughout the season, not in your typical church sort of way, and certainly not in Bible studies way, uh, or or not in a chapel way, I guess you'd call it, uh, because they're all over the country. But with technology, God has brought these umpires together to continue to minister to each other. So loved having Chris on the podcast. Let's get right to it. I think you guys will enjoy hearing the testimony and the story of Major League Baseball umpire Chris Guccione here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jason. It's a pleasure to be on with you this morning. Yeah, it's good to talk to you. You mentioned this morning, and it is only, you know, it's a little before noon East Coast time as we're taping this, and I'm in Connecticut. You're on the other side of the country. You're in Seattle, Washington for a series right now, and you're up pretty early. It's 8.45, I guess, in the morning as we tape this there, and I got to imagine games get over pretty late in baseball. That's kind of a midnight or after midnight type of situation when everything's done. You're a pretty early riser, I guess, huh? Yeah, you know, usually by the time you get back to the, your hotel, it's it's midnight or after, uh, like you said. But I'm a I'm an early bird. I like to get my uh, get up in the morning, start my day, get in the word a little bit. And uh, yeah, I've always been like that ever since my my entire career. I've been like that. I've always been the guy that's never slept in. Eight thirty sleeping in for me. <laughs> that's late. Yeah. So do, do umpires ever get recognized outside of? the baseball, you know, area, you know, even if I guess you're walking in or walking out, but do they ever get recognized? Like, are you ever at a restaurant and somebody's like, aren't you Chris Guccione, the guy that called that out when he was safe on my team last night or something like that? Does that ever happen to you? It it happens on occasion, uh, not too often, but there, there is times where you'll, you'll get recognized more, more than likely it's usually walking out of the ballpark because there's, there's fans there waiting for ballplayers to come out and you're usually using the same doors they exit. So they'll, 
they'll they'll recognize you as you walk out of the ballpark. But in restaurants, not too often, unless you're somebody like Joe West. That's you know he's pretty <laughs> he, he's pretty well known around the league. He's been around for forty years. So <laughs> that's me true. on the other hand, no. That's a great point. Now I wonder you've you've umpired many postseason uh, series. You've done a ton of uh, division series. You were part of a, some LCSs in 2012, 2017. Yeah, we're going to talk about your experience as a world part of the World Series crew in 2016, even All-Star Games. As the playoffs are here and upon us, tell me about just in your past and the experience that you've had umpiring in the playoffs, the difference, I guess, umpiring a playoff game versus a regular season game, or is there a difference? Yeah, I've been blessed to... Uh to work those games and and for me I try to approach I learned this from Jerry Crawford longtime National League umpire worked many many years a lot of World Series under his belt but I mean he was a great guy he approached the game the same way every day all day and he said you walk into spring training and you work the game just like you would in uh, game four five six seven of the playoffs and that's how you know the intensity is there the, the, it's fun. It's exciting. Every every pitch and every play means something, and there is a different atmosphere. But you just, as an umpire, you just instead of being on this roller coaster of emotions, you try to just stay even keel and work the game uh, as you would in April, as you would as in October. And that's how I approach it. You know, mm-hmm. I don't change anything. I don't do anything different. I work out. I do 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 all the same things I do. Have you had to adjust the way you umpire? Maybe all of you guys have with the instant replay over the last few years because you came in in 2000, and we'll talk about your debut in a little bit. But you know, a lot has changed in baseball in you know almost 20 years. Here, have you had to adjust and change the way that you umpire based upon the rule changes, or is everybody everything pretty much still the same? No, you've definitely have changed. Um, positioning wise has changed on some plays just because you know in the past maybe you were a little bit further back but we've learned because of replay there's certain swipe tags especially on pickoffs at first Hmm. if you watch a lot of guys five six seven years ago they would be way back now everybody is either in foul territory or way up close to the back because you know these first basemen they're so good with slapping that tag and it's going to be a swipe tag you have to be in position to see that. And there's not one umpire that uh, wants to miss a play. You know, you, you, yes, you have a, the safety net, I guess, of a replay, but there's not one guy on staff that ever wants to be overturned. And that's not, we don't, we don't use that. You know, we want to get it right. But, and then also the, the focus and your intensity, because you're talking about, I say nanoseconds that plays that guys have to, that want to get right. And, and yeah, so your your umpire has the focus has intensified for sure. We're talking yeah. to Chris Guccione here, MLB umpire on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Let's talk about your faith. Where did that start for you? You're one of the more outspoken. I you can use that word in a relative term, I guess. But what is what does that mean? You know, but you're one of the more people, you know, outspoken, unashamed people of faith uh, that I've met, especially umpires. Tell me about where that walk with the Lord originated for you. Yeah, I didn't, it didn't really, it came about actually not too long ago, really. It was like 2011, but okay. uh, I, I wasn't an atheist. Uh, I always did believe, and I went to church as a kid, but it just was, uh, I didn't know what it meant or how to accept Christ into my life. And, uh, you know, really, and I, it, it was, a, it's a great reminder for me the way I came to faith because. All it was, I was. It was in 20, 2011. I'm um, working with a great crew: Mark Wagner, uh, Mike Winters, and Mike Everett. Mm. And we were just sitting down at breakfast one day, and it was probably the first, first or second week of the season. And Wags, Mark Wagner, walked up. He says, "Hey, man, you know, I go to church, and um, you know, you guys, uh, you're more than welcome to come. Please, you know, you know, it's changed my life." If you come, good. If you don't, that's fine. I'm just throwing out the invitation there. And I'm like, you know what? I'm up early anyway. Why not? Right. You know, I'll come back. We'll go to church. We'll come back, have breakfast, do my thing and all that. So we started going to church. And myself, Mike, Everett, and Mark all went to church all the time, going, going, going throughout the year. And, you know, my heart just started to change, you know. And and we'd sit there and I'd listen to the messages and, 
I started diving into the word more and, and, and yeah. So, and it was that year, uh, you know, I, I was sitting in a church. Mark had actually got hurt earlier that year. Mike was, I think, either switched crews or he was, uh, had to go home for, uh, you know, wedding or something. But I went to church by myself and I just got down on my knees after a church service, sat there and said, Jesus, I'm sorry. Hmm. You know, I'm a sinner and, you know, I want you in my life. And, I walked out of the church. It wasn't like any kind of confetti or anything was blowing off in the thing, but I know the angels were singing in heaven. So, wow. Now, so he, there's a lot of questions I could ask off of that. Was that, uh, it's funny because I, I always talk to a lot of people, especially those that come to faith later in life. I was 26 when I began my walk with the Lord. So, if this was 2011, you were in your 30s, it looks like. So, what was it before that just wasn't clicking for you and your faith or was it just something you never really thought about that made you want to kind of change and make that decision other than people inviting you to church uh there had to be something going on inside of you that that made you want to make that change it's see, hindsight is always great because you could see like throughout my entire life where god was putting people like in my path and, and you could say okay maybe accidentally but i, I don't call it accidents Right. He was put and it kept just kind of planting seeds. And there was different people in my minor league career, Ted Barrett being one of them. And yeah. I know Teddy's been on the on the on the podcast. Sure. And huge in like he's just a he's just a big teddy bear. I mean, he is he he loved the minor league guys anyway. So it's always good to look back, but I I kind of compare it to I was going down a life of sin and destruction as I look at it now. And, you know, there was, you know, going out after the games and, you know, drinking and, you know, profanity and all this stuff. But I, I, I kind of like, this is what I, I picture it as. I was in this, as you, as you watch the, the, the water in the bathtub go down the drain. Yeah. And you living, you're living this life of sin and you're like on the outside and you're fine. And, and as, as life goes on and you continue to live this life of destruction, you're going down this drain and it's just getting tighter. And this vortex of water is like spinning you out of control until you're eventually like you're ready to go down in the drain. That, that was my life. And, and I, I guess Maybe I really didn't realize it because I think once you get in there, it's like, oh, I'm cool. I, I'm in control. But yet yeah, you're like going down this drain, spinning out of control, right. thinking you're in control. And, you know, it was just that invitation. And it was Jesus that set, snatched me out. You know, I didn't crawl out of there. He pulled me out of the, the drain. So I don't know if there was any really one thing that that really made me turn or it was just a simple invitation that started softening my heart, you know, and then yeah. as we as Christians know, the Holy Spirit works. Sometimes it's instantaneously on people. Like they come to fake, like bam, it hits them in the face and other people, it's kind of slower. You know, it just takes, takes a while. Yeah. It's a process. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's what it was for me too. Now, let me ask you, were you married at the time of this sort of gradual? You've been, you're married. How long have you been married? Yeah. So actually, man, my wife, she's awesome. And, and any <laughs> husband would say that, but, of course. We, we're coming up on 20 years, September 26th. Wow. That's awesome. Well, congratulations and happy anniversary. Yeah. But I wonder how for her, because for me, I grew up, a little background, my wife and I grew up Catholic. We didn't really go to church much, though, didn't really care about the Lord. Then I got saved and I became a Christian and my wife still wasn't quite there yet. I don't know if that was the case for you, but how was that for your marriage with all of a sudden this sort of new conversion for you? Was your wife kind of already walking with the Lord and just waiting for this to happen or was this sort of a little more complicated than that? Yeah. So pretty cool story. She, she also grew up in the Catholic church. That's kind of where I started going on out as a kid, but she was, her family was a little bit more involved uh, in the church. And, and uh, unlike my family where we just kind of went every once in a while. Sure. But anyway, it was, and she kind of fell out of the faith at, at a college and, and kind of through that, those years of her life, so as you've kind of fast forward to her and uh we're married at this point we're probably married about 6 or 7 years maybe 5 6 7 years she started watching the hour of power mm -hmm. now this is probably like 2000 we'll say like 2005 
Okay. So she'd watch the Hour of Power um, with uh, Doctor Schuler. Is it Schumer or Schuler? Every every Sunday, and I'd sit there and I'd be like, okay, yeah, this is kind of boring. But I'd sit there <laughs> with her because she felt like, it, you know, it was probably a part of her life that, you know, she was missing out on because, you know, it, and really it was like a question that she, was posed to her by a friend. Like she said, her, then the question to her from her friend was, hey, are are you a Christian? And and my wife Amy, she really didn't know how to answer that. She was like, yeah, but. I guess I don't really know what I am. Anyway, so we started watching the Hour of Power. And then, I mean, now you're fast forwarding all the way. This is like 05. Now you go all the way to 2011. You know, and, and during that same time, she, we went to some churches. We were living in Brighton, Colorado. And, you know, she, we, we went to a few churches at the time, like, you know, a few Sundays here and there. And uh, they were non cat just a non-denominational church. She didn't really want to get involved with. A, a title, you know, like a, the Catholic Church or Baptist Church or Lutheran Church. So sure. we went to this non-denominational church and went there a few times. But then all of a sudden it was like 2011, and it was like this change that happened in my life. And she was like, "Geez, like you just wished right by me." And <laughs> and uh, yeah, but so that that was kind of that that backstory there. No, that's cool. I mean, it's it's neat that. You know, your wife was sort of, like you said, plant, a lot of people were planting seeds. That, those were seeds that were being planted. Absolutely. You probably didn't even realize it when it was happening. Um, we're talking to Chris Guccione here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. Hey, did you always want to be an umpire? I wonder because, uh, you know, I umpired, I think I was like 13 or 14. I probably started umpiring, maybe even 12. I was doing some very, you know, like the field for Little League games in my little town in New York where I grew up. Was that something you always wanted to do and always found an interest in when you were younger? Yeah, so th- this is a, another cool story. So I started playing baseball uh, at the age of five. It was Little League Baseball. Actually, I was four, and my dad said, just tell them you're five, okay? When they come and ask you, you're five this year, not four. So I actually started a year earlier than I was supposed to. But I played baseball in our small town of Salida, Colorado, for many, many years. And it was probably I was probably 12 or 13 that uh, you know they needed some umpires for the games. And I'm like, hey, I'm here. My brother was you know, in the, in, he was in the pitching, we had pitching machine, uh, league. He was playing that. And my dad was coaching. I'm like, heck, I'll do it. I'm here. <laughs> and I started umpiring at, at, at 12, 13 years old, making five, five bucks a game. And yeah, which sure. was great for me because I took that five bucks and went right down to the tackle store and bought a couple lures. And I was good for the week, you know, to go fishing <laughs> all day. So heck yeah. Yeah. So I started doing that. And then it wasn't until, Kind of around that little bit around that time, a year or two later, there was a great friend of mine in high school. His name was Chris Clarkson, and his dad, dad John, who was a pastor of uh, a local church in my hometown. He was uh, part of the Church of God, I think it was called at the time. And uh, so he started this little umpiring, uh, I guess, were you were like a little umpire group and there like was a clinic? myself yeah like not a clinic well we had like a little clinic but a, like an umpire association that's okay. what it was got it and we got the you know we got the proper uniforms and kind of looked the part and all that because before that we were i was wearing you know the the cut off jean shorts and <laughs> knee high socks and i had the old balloon protector you know running around the field but that's what we did then but so we got this little, he got this little association started up. We got the gear, we got the uniforms, looked the part, did all that. It was myself, Chris, he had a brother, CP, and John. And there might have been one or two other guys from, from the little town there that were part of this, this association. But so we did that up until uh, just out of high school. I went to college for a semester, didn't like it. I did more hunting and fishing than I did going to school, so that probably was part of the problem. So I got out, started was working. I was working uh, with my cousin painting houses. But anyway, so he says, "Hey, why don't you guys go to umpire school?" And I'm like, and, and in my hometown, once you turn 15, that was it. There was no. I mean, I grew up in a town of 5,000 people, so there was no Legion ball. Once 15 was there, there was no high school baseball until I was a senior in high school. So that was 92, 91, 92. And I threw the shot putting discus yeah. uh, then. But so, yeah, so he says, why don't you guys go to umpire school? I'm like, all right, what is it? And sure, why, how much does it cost? So we we raised funds. It was um, 2500 3000 for the for the month and uh, went down to Jimmy Evans 
Academy in uh, Kissimmee, Florida, and we raised the money through, you know, we had fundraisers because we, we did, my dad worked at the high school and, and, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't have $3,000 laying around. So we raised the money, did some fundraising, car washes, whatever, that people in the community helped us go. And myself and CP and Chris all went, took a Greyhound bus, 52 hours from Salida, Colorado to Kissimmee, Florida. So that was wow. quite an adventure. 52 hours imagine. on a bus. You see some interesting things on a bus and, <laughs> for 52 hours. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And then what happens? So we went down to Empire School, and uh, that a, was a five-week course, five or six-week course, and we all went down there, and we all made it out. We all got into the minor league system, all three of us, which was unheard of. You know, it's hard enough to get in, but for three guys from the same small town to all get into minor league baseball is pretty unheard of. So they were pretty pumped and – um we got back on the bus six weeks later and drove 52 hours back to Salida, Colorado from Kissimmee, Florida. So, <laughs> yeah, so then we went to, you know, you get into the, the development. You go back like 10 days later to the, uh, at the time it was called Umpire Development Program, which is done by the minor league system. You go to the developmental course and then they, you work games and there's a little bit of training, and but mostly you work the games now. There's uh, like colleges and stuff. They were playing like tournaments and stuff. And they put you in spring training, and you kind of get thrown into the system, and and off you go. You try to get to the big leagues. So give me the system a little bit, where you umpired through. I assume it's a lot like a player, right? Single A, double A, triple A. Give me the sort of system of how you went through. You don't have to expand everywhere and every city and all that, but just kind of how you progress through the system before you, you make it to the majors. Yeah, so uh, this was 1995. So I was invited to, or I was put in the Oriole camp at the time. You remember that was a strike year too in 95. Yes, it was. Yeah. So 94 was, was the strike and then it went yeah. into 95. Yeah. 95, yeah. So 95. So, uh, the Orioles, uh, I think they were one of the few teams that were not using. Now, if my memory, I might, my memory might be off, but I thought they weren't using replacement players. Uh, so they were playing all inner squad games. So they just had inner squad games. So that was 95. So I, spring training, 95, and then that same year, I went to the Pioneer League, which is like Montana area, Idaho. Okay. There was a couple teams in Canada. So that was 95. 96, I went to the Midwest League, which is kind of all those states around the uh, Lake Michigan. So Wisconsin, and there was a couple teams in Iowa, kind of that area. And uh, let's see, so 97, I went to the California League which is uh, stretched all the way at the time from um, our far further south team was Lake Elsinore and our furthest northern team was Stockton. So that was uh, 97. 98 and 99, I was, uh, I was in the Texas League, which included Texas. Man, there's, I'll tell you, there are some trips there. We'd leave <laughs> El Paso, Texas and have to drive to either Wichita, Kansas, or Shreveport, Louisiana, or Jackson, Mississippi. And you're talking 14, 15, 16, 17 hours in a, in a, in a van with two other guys. Wait, you'd and, have to drive? You wouldn't have, yeah. like, travel with, I don't know, teams or however that works? None of that? You just had to drive from city to city? Yeah, that's how you did in the minor leagues. And, and finally, Oof. like, you would just use your own personal car, whoever was the driver in those other, other leagues I was explaining them. The right. Texas League, they gave you a van, like a minivan, and you would pile up in there, and off you went. Seven, 15 hours later, you'd roll into the city. Oh, man, I'll tell you, leaving El Paso, Texas, going eastward, like if you're going to Shreveport, yeah. you'd be hitting – you'd leave at night after the game. Then once you got out of El Paso a little way, you lost the hour, so you lost another hour going through Texas. And then I'll tell you what, Texas is a big state. You'd hit Dallas, the sun <laughs> would be coming up, and you still got – three, four hours to Shreveport. So, wow. yeah, so that was, uh, that was 98, 99, the Texas league in 2000, I was invited to major league spring training, um, that, that spring. And then I also worked my first game in the big leagues, like late April of 2000. And then from 2000 to 2008, I worked around, uh, 21, 2200 games. No, it wasn't that many. It was, uh, 
about 15, 15, 1,600 games in the big leagues as a minor league call-up umpire, meaning I filled in for injuries, guys that needed to take you know a week off for weddings or stuff like that. So I was an up-and-down guy, as we call it. So you were we like a player. A- like a player is in the minors for – you know, 30, 40 games and then back up to the majors for 15, 20 and then back down yep. to the minors. That was the same for you as an umpire for many years. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. And then in two, 2009, I was hired full time on the major league staff. Right. Wow. Yeah. I mean, and you're married at this time because you said you're 20 mm-hmm. years. So that must have yeah. been interesting. Like was your, I hope maybe she wasn't, but I assume your, is your wife traveling with you at this point, you know, to no, all the different no. cities or is she still back home? She's still back home. Wow. Here's a cool, and I'll tell you, this will tell you what kind of person my wife is and how she's been. I mean, we've been through this, this whole system as, I mean, we were in our twenties, you know, I was, I went to umpire school at 20 yeah. and she's, she was born, uh, she was a, she's just a few months younger than I am. She was born, I was in June, she's November. We were in different classes. She's a class of 93, I'm 92, but you know, we're not that far in age. But anyway, there was one time in my entire career that I was ready to like, I'm done. I've had enough. It was, I was sitting in Wichita, Kansas. It was 1998. It, we were getting married that year. We got married in 98. Obviously this, this coming year is our 20th. Um, so we're sitting there. She drove from Denver. She was, she was going to school at CU Boulder. And so she drove out. This is probably like May. She drives out to Wichita, Wichita, Kansas, it's eight, 10 hour trip from, from Boulder. And we're getting married, like I said. She's also graduating from college, and uh, so and, and I, I so. Long story short, we're sitting at breakfast. She's getting ready to leave, and I said, "That's it. I'm done. I'm tired of this life. I'm tired of the road. Hmm. I just want to. I just want to go home with you. I mean, I'm I'm ready to hang it up. Like I was kind of in the dump. She kind of looked at me, and I kind of put words in her mouth. But this is what she kind of passed on. She basically said suck it up we've come too far now and i'm like all right cool i'll see you babe we'll see you when i get home in september <laughs> and that was it she never once said oh i hate this job you're gone all the time not a once jay she's been so supportive and like i said and it takes a strong woman to be you know and now we have a daughter and to do this all on her own and it's she's awesome anyway yeah so how old is your daughter so she'll be three in october three so you waited yeah, so a long started, time to have kids. We waited to the very last moment of time that you could probably want to start having kids in our 40s. So yeah. We're talking to Chris Guccione here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. I want to go back to April 25th, 2000. That was your Major League Baseball debut. Um, and I know you kind of worked, like you said, part-time before becoming full-time in 09. But that's still a big day, right? That first game that you ever do. What do you, what do you, ever, what do you remember about that game and just – getting that call and where was it take us to sort of paint the picture for us of, of what that game was and you getting that call. Yeah. So, uh, I was sitting, I think I was sitting in Memphis. It's amazing how you can remember some of these details. I think I was sitting in Memphis. Uh, men, I was, I think it was in Memphis and I got the call, uh, from at the time, Tom Leopard, who worked with the major league baseball office, which Tommy still works uh, he he still works with the office. Uh, he does a lot of the minor league stuff. But so Tom Leopard called, and I, I was going from Memphis to Des Moines, where Tom Tommy Leopard, that's where he lives in Des Moines, and that they had the AAA team there in Des Moines, which they still do. So he's call he calls me. He's hey hey uh, hey Gooch, how you doing? I was like hey, I'm good, Tommy. He goes hey you're gonna make your debut. And I'm like yeah I know. He's like you know. <laughs> I go yeah we're coming to Des Moines. I, I was thinking yeah we're coming to Des Moines to see you. He goes. No, man. He says, you're making your debut in the big leagues. I said, what? <laughs> I said, oh, that's, that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, so I, I uh, flew from Memphis to Atlanta, Georgia, and I worked uh, third base. I don't really remember. Uh, not a whole lot happened. I think uh, it was a pretty quick game. Uh, I think you're kind of in shock and awe. Like, this is a huge ballpark. I can't believe I'm on a big league, you know, uh, in a big league stadium on big league grass and yeah and yeah it's not until probably like the your fifth or tenth game where it's like oh wow this is this is the big leagues <laughs> right you're and on cloud kinda, nine right yeah yeah before that you're like on cloud nine yeah tell me so what um at, it was the braves against who who was that against Do you remember i think i think it was the dodgers okay yeah i love that 
And then yeah, for nine have... years, you kind of go back and forth, right? From yeah. 2000 to 2008, up and down. Is yep. there a game that sticks out in, the, in those years? And it could even be a game more recently that sticks out that maybe was the best game that you've been a part of. And I don't mean best as far as your umpiring. And maybe that could be it too. But just like, holy cow, this is happening right now and I'm a part of it. You know, whether it's a no-hitter or World Series or something. What's the best game or most memorable game you've been a part of? No, no question about it. No, there's no questions at all. Game 7 of the 2016 World Series. I mean, mm-hmm. no question. The way that game, the Cubs being down, you know, three games to one. Game 7, Cubs look like they're going to win. The homer. You know, that Rajay Davis hits, then the rain delay. It, it, yeah, no, plus to be a part of the World Series and my family to be there, my wife to be there and experience all that. That was, that was, that was really cool. And I'll tell you one other game that sounds kind of silly that I had such a great honor to work this year. And it might sound, sound like very small, but I was invited to work in Williamsport this year. During, oh, yeah, the Little so, League World Series. The Little League World Series. And I got to walk on the – uh, the probably the purest form of baseball you could ever be a part of. I mean, it's just kids and parents that love the game and are just in this great opportunity to be, to be part of this World Series. And I worked two innings of of the of one of the little league games at second base. I worked the first and second inning. And to be part of that and to be part of that atmosphere was pretty memorable. I mean, it brought me right back down to when I was five years old. Yeah. And to look at these kids and these parents and and the umpires and what it takes for them to be able to work this game. Like, mm. it takes them 10, 12 years to even – you, you got to be put in this lottery system. You know, it takes them a long time to get there, and it's one and done. They work one of those World Series, and that's it. They, you know, that it, it's off to the next next group of guys. But – Man, that was that was enjoyable. Now, was that something connected with Major League Baseball that they just had you guys, you know, as part of it? And and was it obvious that you were a Major League? Were you wearing your Major League Baseball garb, you know, sort of the uniform, if you will, as an umpire for these games, so the kids knew, hey, that guy's a Major League Baseball umpire, or were you just kind of fitting in as another ump? No, they they you you were wearing your your Major League outfit, your okay. you know your uniform. So yeah, they definitely know. And um, so it's something that the commissioner's office started last year and they have, it's during the players weekend where they can wear the nicknames on their back yes. of their jerseys and all that. Yeah. Great weekend. And that all stemmed from, yeah, it's awesome. And it stemmed all from this Williamsport game and Jerry Davis did it last year. And he, they asked him, Hey, would you be interested? And he's like, yeah, I'd love to. Well, then they asked me this year. And what you do is you work those two innings. And then that night is the uh, uh, game on, uh, you know, it's the one game on, um, on ESPN, it's that Sunday night baseball game, and then you're the home plate umpire for that. So I worked the two innings of that game, and then worked the the it was the Phillies and the Mets, I think. Right? Mets, yeah, Phillies yeah. and the Mets, yeah. So That's I worked right. the game that night. I worked home plate, but you know you work in this minor league ballpark uh, in Williamsport. It's I think it's an A ball team. I mean the stadium holds maybe thirty five hundred people, and it's nothing but kids and parents and uh, you know little league people. It's not fans it's not it's just them so it's it's just the kids and uh it, it what an awesome experience like i said the world series and i've worked a lot of all-star game and i've been part of some great playoff series and uh, you know just the whole thing i mean how how do you put one at the top or the other it's just what a i mean it's just so humbling to be able to be part of some of these things for you during the season going to church, you know, cause you're obviously Sunday mornings are, you know, you're, you're getting ready for a game in most Sunday mornings. I would imagine, especially from, from March or April, maybe even March in the spring training all the way through October, if you're lucky enough to do uh, a postseason, what does that look like for you? Do you find a church that you're able to go to an early service in whatever city you're in? Do you attend a chapel service or do you just kind of do your own thing? So, yeah, so finding a church is, um, it can be done, but it can be a little difficult because of the the timing-wise. So it's pretty hard to, to do church uh, on a Sunday morning. Right. But we do have, uh, there is a baseball chapel who, uh, um, they they have chapel service that they do for the players. Well, they also include us 
you know, they'll come to our, our clubhouse. Okay, our so you're not going to the chair. one that the players are in and interacting with them, but you have your own. No, yeah, so we have, okay. they come in and they, they give you the same message they give the players each, each side. And so they'll bring Chapel in, and, and that's like maybe 10 or 15 minutes. It's pretty short, but it's still great. I mean, but I know only that, Jace, is so I'm part of this ministry called Calling for Christ. Mm-hmm. And it's a ministry that was started about 15 years ago by Ted Barrett and Rob Drake. And, but um, it's kind of morphed into uh, involving more people and we got a board and, and, and we, we throw around these ideas. But so one of the things that we started this year, which has been really cool is because of technology, we stumbled onto zoom. Yeah. I'm sure most people know what zoom is. Sure. Uh, you know, you could get on your iPad or even on your iPhone, you just download the app, but you know, it's a big uh, meeting, virtual meeting area. Yeah. It's like a conference on the, on the web basically. Yeah. 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 So we started doing church via zoom and, uh, we, I was on my regular crew this year is Dave Rackley, who's part of the same ministry, who's also uh, on the board, the, the CFC ministry. So we started throwing out these ideas like, hey, why, why can't we do like a church service? We'll do it at 10 o'clock on the east. And it's pretty early for guys out on the west. But, you know, if you want to get on, you can. And we'll just do, we'll do church on, on Sunday. We'll do some worship music and, and, you know, we'll do the whole thing. And we thought, well, maybe we could just do some, pull guys off of YouTube. You know, there's so many guys that are so good that sure. you could just kind of stream that way or. And we said, heck, why don't we just do it as a group? You know, we'll just start our own little sermon series and we'll just get on there and talk and, and have church. And that's what we've done. And we started probably mid, maybe mid-May and rolled this out. And so we have church now on Sundays on Zoom. That's so cool. Have you been it able to lead? Cool. Have you been able to lead, uh, get your chance to kind of lead uh, and, and share a sermon a little bit? Yeah, so I've I've taught a couple times on there, and Dave has done a lot of it. Teddy's done some of it. We've had some. Uh, um, uh, there's another gentleman, Jeff Orge, who is really important to the ministry, and he's the uh, president of a seminary in Southern California. Um, you know, there's been some different baseball chapel guys that have been on. I was going to say you could literally uh, yeah. get anybody to kind of yeah. share it through Zoom, right? Yeah, I mean, that's it's, so cool. It's kind of an informal, formal type of thing, you know, and some of them's more been like a Bible study instead of like an actual, and some of them has been like more sermonish. Some of them has been more teachings. It's yeah. So That's it's awesome. been great. That's awesome. Really cool. I yeah. love that. It's a great thing to hear because I know players have their chapel and I talk to players a lot on this podcast, former and current about staying grounded in the Lord during the difficult seasons, long, you know, long baseball seasons, long football seasons, whatever, what have you. But it's funny with technology, you can do that right now. And I know I was talking to uh, Matt Hasselbeck, who's a former NFL quarterback, and he was telling me how he does that now, too. He does a Bible study once a week with a bunch of former players, and it's all done online. I don't know if he uses Zoom, but it's such a cool way. And you forget Mm -hmm. technology for all its flaws and all its faults. And in many ways, that's how we're able to do this interview, Chris, is, is really wonderful to be able to stay connected in the Lord that way. Yeah. And you know what's cool about CFC, too, is... Not only do we have that, the Sunday service that we came up with, but prior to uh, prior to the Sunday service, we've uh, we've I mean, we've been doing this for 15 years. Well, I wasn't part of the ministry, obviously, all those 15 years. But there's a we have a prayer call, which is a you know, we got a, a conference call line that guys can call in every Friday at four Eastern and somebody will bring a quick little message, whatever's on their heart. You know, you can. Um, do whatever, you know, you can read from a talk from personal experience, whatever. And you just share, share something on that call. And then we take, you know, we'll, we'll have a prayer time, about a 15 minute call. And that's every Friday. And then what we also started is because, you know, being an umpire is pretty unique. We're very, uh, we can get in the room, a lot of alone time, a lot of, you know, you can shut the door, shut the curtains, you're in your room, Sure. you know, you could just cave it up and, and not really show people who you really are, you know, until you walk outside and you reveal yourself. And, and then we're great at putting on masks, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, we could put that happy mask on. Nothing's wrong with me mask on. Oh, I'm, I'm strong. You know, I don't sin mask, all that stuff. You could put any kind of mask you want. And, 
and just deceive people. But and we know that as umpires, and really people that aren't umpires don't really understand an umpire life. Just like I don't know a football player's life, I don't know how it is to be, uh, you know, a doctor's life. Anyway, sure. So, uh, and we all have our struggles. But so anyway, so we started with, uh, you know, and I, uh, it, it's an interesting culture we're part of. So Dave and I, really Dave Rackley again, he's done the bulk of this stuff. I'm not, I'm just kind of like, I'm helping a little bit here and there, but, and he throws ideas off of me, but man, he's been pulling a lot of the weight. What a great guy. And I've, I've been blessed to be on this crew two years out of the last three. So we, we're always talking, you know, the great theological questions and throwing out, you know, ideas and thoughts. And anyway, so he stumbled onto this uh, book called uh, the Samson society and the pirate monks. Hmm which was started by this man named Nate Larkin, who was a pastor of a church that was uh, wrapped up and basically enslaved with, you know, and this is in his book, pornography, you know, seeking out prostitution and and all that. And he was leading this church, you know, he ended up leaving the church and getting into like a a business, uh, you know, working in an office while it, it still just fell apart. Finally, it all came crumbling down. Wife found out, you know, almost lost his marriage and everything. Hmm. But he started this thing called the Samson Society, which is basically it, it's it started kind of like from an AA kind of thing, you know. Yes. But I've never been to an AA meeting. But an AA doesn't really involve Christ at all. It's just kind of like, but it's the same. It's he's kind of there, but he's off to the side. Well, this involves Christ, but it's the same thing. Very. Uh, uh, there's, there's, it's all scripted out. And anyway, so every Wednesday we do these Samson society calls and, and really the, mo- the most of this is guys that are addicted to pornography and lusting and stuff like that. And it's a place and uh, just a long story, uh, short is a place where you can be authentic, be who you are and nobody's going to judge you. I mean, if you're addicted to pornography or you're addicted to alcohol, you can share it on this call and it's just umpires. And we know exactly because either there's somebody else on this call that's dealing with it, has gone through it, or knows somebody that's has battled it or or going through it at the, at the time. And it's just this authentic community where we don't have to be men, the so-called men. Yeah, I got to be strong, right. and we can let people into our lives. You know, break down that wall, and that's so huge for for any man, you know, to or or women to break down that the so persona that hey uh, i don't cry there's nothing wrong with me and i'm strong i'm an umpire and you know nobody's going to touch me no we just be authentic and be a community and what it is is it, it, it all based from there's two people in the bible that are basically the same people but they approached life differently one being samson who was a loner and tried to do everything on his own strength and look what it got him mm-hmm. and the other one was david king david who was the same way but he always had people around him right. and he was authentic and he was, he, he let people into his lives and into his life. Unlike Samson who relied on his strength. David was a very strong man, but very weak man, but he was willing to share with the, his closest people around him. And that's mm-hmm. the whole thing. And we're all, we're all more like Samson than we are like David. Yeah. And we try to do it all on our own strength. And so this is a way to, you know, being authentic community it's really good. and a brotherhood. Yeah. So. That's awesome. Listen, yeah. Chris, it's been great talking to you. I really appreciate it. We'll hopefully have you on again. There's more questions I have, but you know, time is of the essence and I want to, I want to save some of those questions for the next time we have you back on, but it's really been great to talk to you and hear your yeah. heart and hear some baseball stuff as well. And so wish you nothing but the best and we'll talk again soon. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. It's been a pleasure. And we do thank Chris Guccione, Major League Baseball umpire, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. I think my favorite part of that whole uh, interview with Chris was the area where he talked about how all the umpires are getting together each Sunday morning on Zoom, literally just using technology on their computer to connect and to uh, share and to learn about God and to really just be uh, accountable to each other as umpires who love the Lord and just so cool. I, I love seeing ministry, sort of sports ministry and, and, and coming together, this, the world of sports and faith, which is what this podcast is about. 
and even the umpires, the ones that we argue with and look at when we're sports fans and say, what are you looking at? What is that call? Even these guys are human, and many of them love the Lord. And so we thank Chris Guccione for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. We also thank you for listening. You can always reach us uh, via social media, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, of course. Even our YouTube channel has lots of videos uh, as well as every single episode of the podcast. I'd also encourage you to go back and listen to episode 21 of the podcast. That was with Ted Barrett, who's also a Major League Baseball umpire. So we've had two umpires on the podcast, Ted Barrett, and then, of course, today with Chris Guccione. Both really great guys who love the Lord and have great stories, just great baseball stories. Lots of fun talking to them about baseball as much as it is talking about the Lord. So you can reach us there. You can also email me, jason at sportspectrum.com with any ideas, any guest suggestions. And we'd love to encourage you to take a screenshot, share this podcast on your social media pages, letting people know about what's going on here with the podcast and Sports Spectrum, the intersection of sports and faith. We also thank our partners, Compassion International, Sponsoring this podcast, Compassion Does It Right, 1.8 million children being released from poverty through the great work being done by Compassion International. Over 150,000 children last year came to know Jesus Christ as their Savior through Compassion International. And here's how you come in. We want to challenge you. We'd even want to encourage you to think about sponsoring a child through Compassion. It's $38 a month. It's a great way to connect. It's wonderful if you have a family to kind of help your kids understand how you as a family are making a difference in a child's life. Someone who doesn't have the basic necessities, the essentials, food, clothing, education, those very basic things that every child deserves. That's the difference you make when you sponsor a child with Compassion International. It's $38, I promise you, $38 a month, you won't regret it. It's the best $38 you'll spend every single month. Sponsor a child today. Go to Compassion.com slash Sports Spectrum. I promise you, you won't regret it. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. We'll see you next time right here on Sports Spectrum. Have a great rest of your day.